All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our haunted house design summer skills session. Um, we have a couple presenters today that we're really excited to uh, to hear from and learn from their experiences. Um, so first, I'll introduce Matthias Baker, um, student at UCSD. He will be leading their haunted house design for this coming year. Um, and he also helped a lot with the previous year. So he's got a lot of experience in what's been done and also how to organize um, a big project, especially with coronavirus coming in. Our second presenter is Seth Husband from um, University of Texas, Austin. He also founded um, and has a lot of experience running their haunted house on campus as well, um, and has internship experience in this sort of side of the industry as well that he'll be able to touch on for us. And then lastly, we have Ted, um, our industry professional who will sort of be moderating and giving us his, his experience on top of what Matthias and Seth have to share with us. Um, so with that, I'll pass it off to you, Ted, and uh, Go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm really happy to be doing this. And uh, if we want to hit the first slide, we could kind of introduce ourselves a little bit more in, in, in depth. Uh, Matthias uh, put this PowerPoint together and, and snagged this shot of me clearly off the internet, which is like the worst picture that I've seen of myself, but so be it. Uh, so, so yeah, so my name is Ted Doherty. I am a writer, producer, and director for uh, the, the seasonal entertainment uh, field in the theme park industry for experiences. I've worked with all of the, pretty much all the main sort of players here in, in Southern California, Universal Studios in Hollywood for their Halloween Horror Nights, uh, not Scary Farm, Queen Mary's Dark Harbor, LA Haunted Hayride, uh, many, many more did, have done a lot of experiential marketing, uh, that type of thing, and uh, have a lot of fun uh, creating these types of experiences. So that's me just a little bit. Seth, you want to tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, so I'm about to go into my last year of getting my degree in mechanical engineering at the uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I've been very involved with the uh, Texas Theme Park Engineering Group through all of my years there at school. Um, one of the things I, I've absolutely loved doing since I started there was um, my sophomore year, we were able to start doing a haunted house on campus. Um, and for two years going there, I was in charge of it. And it's, the, the torch has been passed since then, um, but it's been growing every year and it's been a huge huge thing that like huge part of my college experience so far um it's a ton of fun and kind of bouncing off that um definitely knew i wanted to pursue some sort of career within the industry um with that uh went to iapa did all the did all the things and um uh, met a few companies there uh ended up interning at a place called uh, little spider creations and we got to uh work on some haunted house stuff that we'll touch on later um, and since then, I just got finished up uh, interning with Universal Creative and hoping to stay in the industry once I graduate. Very cool. And Matthias, what about you? Uh, yeah, I'm Matthias Baker. I'm a fourth year heading into four plus years at UCSD studying cognitive science. Cognitive science is at least in my particular specialization with it kind of the study of how people interact with things um, and sort of uh, how we can shape interaction and so interaction design is a big part of kind of what I like to do um, and this industry is such a practical form of interaction design um, it's not stuck behind a screen it's something that you can watch people walk into and um, kind of see how they respond and, and learn and it's just such a cool back and forth between the designer and the person, the guest. Um, yeah, so I joined uh, my TEA club when I could pretty much. We were founded my sophomore year. I joined at the very, very beginning of my junior year. Um, and since then I've kind of been trying to immerse myself in haunts specifically uh, as much as possible. I joined the club on the basis um, of knowing that they were running a project where we would be putting on like a scare maze. It's been my dream to do that since I was a little kid and I had a little bit of experience on it earlier, which I'll uh, touch on. Um, but yeah, so I kind of started by being a part of that project. Um, in the interim, I won a competition for my um, 
the TEA at UNLV escape room design competition, um, where I designed a horror version of the Pinocchio fairy tale. Um, and then, yeah, we sort of put together a maze, which was called Petrified last year. And uh, I took over for this upcoming one this next year, which is going to be called Wonderland. So, yeah. Very cool stuff. And, and, and you just mentioned something that I think is really important. Uh, this industry. So we're going to talk a little bit about what this industry really kind of is. Uh, but instead of me kind of rambling on about a bunch of the stuff that I've worked on, what we thought would be fun would be to allow uh, Seth and Matthias uh, to, to, to answer some questions that we've come up with and uh, and see what they've kind of learned along the way. And hopefully by seeing what they've done, uh, you guys will all be able to maybe apply some of that thinking and strategy to things that you might be interested on in the future. Now, for those who are maybe a little unfamiliar with Halloween special events, uh, they are somewhat separated kind of in a nutshell into three different types of industries. They differ from one another, but there's definitely some overlap with all of them. One industry is the haunted house industry and the haunted attraction industry. That focuses on things like the props and the pneumatics and the masks and the theatrical makeup and the airbrushing, heavy duty uh, costuming for the actors, actor development, uh, scare effects like the drop down panels or air blasts, anything that you can really kind of think of that scares you inside of a haunted house. That's that haunted attraction industry. The second industry is the actual Halloween retail industry. And they sell the costumes for, for the kids and, and the Halloween parties for the masses. Um, every, anything you could think of, of like those inexpensive yard displays or like the blow up inflatables that you see like out on people's lawns and things like that. Things that you can get like at places like Target or like, um, you know, the Spirit Halloween store chain that comes out. Uh, and then there's also like the greeting cards and the candy. A lot of it you see kind of in the, in the grocery store. That makes up most of this multi-billion dollar Halloween industry. A lot of people may have heard them say that the Halloween is second only to Christmas in consumer spending. And most of that is based on the Halloween retail industry. And the, and the third part of it is the amusement park industry, the themed entertainment world, the theme parks. Uh, you know, most parks across America do some sort of Halloween event, especially outside of America too, everywhere from Ocean Park, all of those places, anything from Disney to Universal, uh, Busch Garden, Six Flags, Theater Fair, and all of those events started way back when in 1973 at uh, Knott's Berry Farm here uh, where I'm at in Southern California. Knott's was the very first to host a successful Halloween hard ticket special event at a major theme park. And so all of these other theme parks are all part of that amusement park industry. Seth talked a little bit about IAPA. That's their main trade show that happens every November in Orlando. And each of these industries have their own trade shows, their own line of experts, and, and several companies overlap, like some fabricators and costume companies and masks, lighting uh, companies and special effects. Uh, and, and some companies work in all three. I myself have, have worked in, in all three industries, but a lot of folks uh, find themselves maybe specializing in one or the other. The reason I'm kind of sharing this as sort of a preface in this whole thing is for anybody who might be interested in getting into this type of thing, it's important to really kind of determine what you specifically want to do and what aspect of these different industries and how you can kind of fit into them um, one way or, or the other. Because as we all know, there is no uh, college course in haunting, right? And so it's up to all of us to really kind of share that information pass that along and we're not talking about things like trade secrets or or NDAs or anything like that we're talking mainly about the basic fundamentals on how to keep 
these concepts and these events flourishing. And so that's kind of what we're going to be going over today, learn about what Seth and Matthias have been kind of doing with haunted houses and, and what they've been learning along the way. And maybe that might help you guys decide uh, what you'd like to do if you're interested in this kind of thing. So we'll go ahead and get into the next slide here and, and get this thing started. So, uh, says, what got you interested in haunted attractions in the first place? Did you grew up as Halloween fans, horror movies, attractions. Matthias, why don't you go first? How did you get into this whole thing? Um, so, like, full honesty, I was just a really scared little kid, I think. Um, I was the type of kid that, like, uh, when I was going to sleep, I'd be afraid of the darkness all around me. And then I'd fall asleep and I'd be afraid of the stuff that was happening in my dreams. Um, and the fear kind of became a problem. Uh, it, it grew and sort of became crippling and it affected the way that I was interacting with sort of uh, the world around me. So I, I had to adapt. And um, when I was in my early teenage years, I kind of I spent a lot of time uh, immersing myself in the stuff that had originally scared me, um, those movies or books. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, kind of just trying to desensitize myself to it. Um, and through doing that, kind of developed a, a passion for like, it was almost like it started by challenging myself, like, oh, you know, what would be scary? And then it sort of evolved into like, oh, but this would be even scarier and this would be even scarier. And I sort of just fell in love with the concept of, of horror in general. Um, and so kind of as I grew up, I was presented with a very unique opportunity in that my um, family was moving out of my original home, but we were moving just up the street. Um, and my dad was going to use that house as an office. It's a, old, old house. Uh, it's the second oldest house in my entire town. Um, and my dad was like, hey, you know, for Halloween, if uh, you want to like design some walkthrough experiences of our, our old house, I'll like help you run them and build stuff. And it was, he's an engineer, it was his way of trying to get me into engineering. Um, little did he know it, it didn't work so well, but it did get me very interested in, in haunts. Um, and so I kind of, uh, ran with that experience and I knew that I liked um, kind of the intersection, like I said earlier, of uh, like experience and how people respond to experience. So I, I studied something in the middle and then like I said before, fell into this um, club and it all just sort of feels like I've been pushed in this direction, but it's lovely and I couldn't be happier. Um, yeah. Very interesting. You know, I mean, I did, uh... I, I I did have my own challenges with with fear and and all kinds of stuff as as a kid. Uh, I always grew up loving Halloween because I could pretend I was somebody else. Uh, but I was always infatuated with 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 horror movies and the way the monsters looked. But I got to tell you, the first time I started going to any kind of haunted attraction or anything like that, mine was at Not Scary Farm. I was absolutely petrified. Uh, I, I loved it because I was a fan of theme parks and of, of horror movies and of monsters. But I mean, I was terrified. I was cowering inside one of the stores to hide from the monsters. Uh, but uh, it, it's kind of a, in a similar situation. You kind of end up sort of... Uh, facing those fears and now we dish them out. Uh, Seth, what about you? Yeah, um, for me, uh, the attractions industry for me has always been a huge part of my life. Uh, I grew up probably five minutes down the road from Six Flags over Texas here in Arlington. Um, and naturally, pretty much my whole life, they've been doing um, Fright Fest, so their uh, Halloween event. And I, I never thought I was like quite old enough to, you know, go through the haunted house or anything. But by the time I was going out there with like a small group of friends, um, I was, uh, it was probably like sixth or seventh grade. Uh, I went through like all the haunted houses there that they had. And I was just absolutely fascinated. And before then, that was my first taste of like actual, I guess you could say professional uh, haunted attractions. Before that, we had a family friend um, that lived a couple streets over um and they would run a haunted house in their driveway and it got to the point where i would go every year 
absolutely loved it. And then it got to the point where slowly I started helping out. And by the end of it, I was the guy with the chainsaw at the end after working a few years in it. Um, but it was, it was your typical, you know, you had wood and a bunch of black plastic strung and hallways, um, probably an, ab an absolute fire hazard, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, they spent pretty much the whole week before Halloween, they're building it. And that's kind of how I got my first taste of, I guess you could say like designing and building things and I've absolutely fallen in love with it ever since. Um, probably around that same time, I'm, I would sit on the phone with one of my friends that I did that same thing with. Um, and we'd watch trans world walkthroughs, which is, if you don't know the like huge convention that is just for haunted houses and Halloween, we would sit on the phone and watch trans world walkthroughs all day. <laughs> um, so naturally, uh, growing up and going, going through school and everything, this was something that I was like hu hugely passionate about. And it was something that I definitely wanted to um, pursue a career in uh, going forward. Okay, very cool. And, and he did mention Trans World, and that was kind of, uh, that's, that's the main tra trade show for the haunted attraction industry. So it's kind of, uh, it's like the IAPA for, for, for haunts. And then, and then the Halloween uh, uh, retail uh, industry has its own trade show as well, which is the Halloween and Party Expo that uh, usually takes place in New Orleans every year, but I think they're moving over to Dallas uh, starting uh, next year. So there's a lot of different opportunities and different paths to kind of look at in terms of, of where folks want to uh, wind up in these things. But Seth, I do want to mention, uh, you know, you really started to fall in love with it when you kind of started doing your own thing and getting really involved. And the one thing that always terrified me the most was once I left the safety net of the theme parks like Knots and stuff and started exploring independent haunts or like home haunts and things like that, where there's, there's like no holds barred, the, the rules are out the table a lot of the time, and it's just typically way more terrifying than that 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 safe kind of level that you're used to in the theme parks so let's go ahead and and, and, and uh, go on to the next slide and, and see what we got coming up so uh, well this is for both of you again uh, Seth I'll stay with you can you describe the last haunted attraction you worked on with your university and what did your guests see and experience in terms of these these campus haunts? Yeah, um, so this year was technically our third year um, running our haunted house on campus. Um, the first year being uh, we had the idea and quite frankly, we weren't sure we were able to get it done in time for Halloween. So we came up with this idea called Wreck the Halls and we're saying, uh, let's put it on at Christmas time. Um, so we had this Christmas themed haunted house, um, and quite frankly, I'm not sure if anyone really knew, uh, what was going on until the day we got there and we were, we had planned everything. We weren't sure if it was actually going to happen until we got there and started building it. Um, but lo and behold, it went fairly well. And I think we kind of, uh, got a little bit of respect there from the university. Cause when you go up to someone and you're trying to get rent a room or rent a, rent a stage or a ballroom for a haunted house at Christmas time, everyone kind of looks at you like you're crazy. Um, but at the end of the day, like that kind of like, I guess you could say beta test into the whole idea of running this haunted attraction on this huge college campus went well. Um, we got a bigger room, more budget for the next year. Um, we went up to a little bit, little over a thousand square feet. So not huge. Um, so it was a short little walkthrough. Uh, we had designed a modular like PVC structure so we could all throw it up in one day and take it down in about one day. Um, it went really well. Uh, we had like black plastic on the walls. Uh, there was no specific theme or anything. Uh, it was just each room had its own theme. As guests walked through, they saw different characters and themes as they got through everything. Um, but man, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, by the end of it, uh, this past year, we put through close to 850 guests uh, up from like the little over 100 that we put through the first year. Um, so it was great. Uh, the, the hardest part, honestly, <laughs> Uh, the easy part was just getting the actually building the haunted house. The hard part was, you know, getting all these um, AOKs from everyone around the university and um, making sure we're good to go to do this kind of, I guess you could say, unique uh, like thing that you don't typically see on like college campuses and as of um, recent. 
Very cool. I like the overall kind of theme. And I love the idea of doing this whole Christmas thing too. You know, I mean, uh, the, the Christmas haunts have started to uh, certainly pop up around the country. We still have a handful out in uh, in Southern California that do them every year. And sometimes it's, it's, it's independent haunts and sometimes it's, it's home haunts, but uh, that, that, that's a lot of fun. What are we, are these pictures here that we're looking at? Yeah, I, st I started talking without uh, going to the next slide, but here's some pictures from uh, various years um, of our haunted house that we did. Um, we don't have any, I don't have any pictures on here of, of our wreck the halls Christmas haunted house. Um, but, this, you can kind of see like our, our modular PVC structure over there on the left. Um, I think on the bottom left, that was our cast from 2018. Um, up in the top middle, we had, that was our line that we had built up at one point. Uh, it was kind of difficult, like gauging when we needed to send people in and when not to. Um, Cause like I said, it wasn't super long and we didn't really want people getting like congested in there. Um, and then just a few other pictures of like some sets as well. Very cool, fun stuff. And it's a, it's a nice sort of smaller, manageable uh, cast that you had, which is neat, you know, that gives everybody an opportunity to, to kind of do their thing in terms of, of freaking people out. Um, Matthias, what about you? Yeah, um, so our haunt last year was called Petrified, um, and it gave guests a chance to kind of take a romp through a witch-infested forest. Um, it started with them walking through the forest itself, um, and them sort of having to deal with the nasty byproducts of the witches living in the area um, before they stumble across a cabin and head into the cabin and meet kind of um, the epicenter of the evil which was the god of the forest that lived inside. Um, and I have, yeah, a video. That Do you want me to play together. it? Yeah, by the okay. way, Jared Walker. It should show a lot of kind of what we ended up doing and what it felt and looked like, so. Seth, you're going to want to uh, share your audio on your computer. Oh. There should be like down by the share screen button, um, advanced sharing options or something like that. Um, All right. Sorry about that. No, you're good. Uh... Maybe it's in the more section also. If you yeah, like I've, got a, I've got a little... Uh, bar at the top of my share computer sound. There we go. Gathered at home on a Sunday afternoon. The day of the crime. If you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. If you go down in the woods today,
Very cool. How big was your cast? Um, I couldn't tell you an exact number. We had two shifts of, oh gosh, there are people in the chat who might be able to tell you honestly. Jared, yeah, it was like a little less than 100 people. Oh, hey, Jared. Cool. All right. Awesome. All right. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but uh, let's take a look at the next slide so that way I, I stay on track here. Okay, well then this is good. So Matthias, staying with you, what did you do in your role that last season to convey these elements to the guests? And, and, and really, what did you try to do to, to, to convey uh, that, that story that you were, you were trying to tell? Yeah, so I um, was actually the head of the story committee itself. Um, it had started with kind of, we knew we were doing Witches in a Forest, um, but from mm -hmm. that point it was sort of handed off to me, um, and it was my job along with some of the other um, people working on the project to sort of figure out uh, where we were going to go and what story we were going to tell. Um, and I was also the um, head of layout design and the head of audio and video design for the maze. Um, so I kind of had uh, a little internal war going on with uh, story and layout where it was like uh, one of my roles was sort of a dreamer role and, and one of my roles was much, much more practical. Um, and Originally, the story as uh, I had sort of seen it in my head was some kind of, it was, it was like some real like high concept uh, horror stuff. And very quickly, the kind of practical difficulty of overlaying those ideas onto a physical space um, and a physical space where you really have to worry about throughput, um, that was the main concern when designing the layout um, kind of knocked a lot of that highbrow horror stuff uh, out pretty quickly. Um, and it turned into sort of like what is a simple and effective story that we can tell that, that might actually be conveyed to the guests. Um, and so I don't know if you guys picked up on it from the video, but the story itself is uh, as simple as there is a group of witches that are worshiping a um, forest god or the god of the forest, the deity at the, at the heart of the forest um, and harnessing its power to do evil magic. Um, and yeah, like I said before, you start by kind of walking through some of that evil magic in the forest before finding the cabin and eventually meeting the, the god in that red room um, that was shown. And so, yeah, it quickly became how do we translate uh, that into a physical walkthrough that is not going to uh, take so long to actually get through. Um, and so, like, I mean, the number one thing we had to consider was really just the space itself. Um, we knew where we were going to be able to work, um, and we worked really hard to secure that particular location. It's a theater with two floors. Um, and so it, and this year is the same actually, um, it, it became a project of looking at the space and how we can subdivide the space to create like these big immersive rooms, um, but still have people moving through different sections of the story. Um, I think by far and away, our greatest success was the very first room that we had, um, which was like the backstage room um, for prepping for a theater show. It was like this big black room um, and we had a projection of a moon that you saw at the beginning there um, and it was our indoor queue. It was where people kind of waited before they were grouped up and actually sent through. Um, and I think we worked really hard on sort of like the audio design and um, we had this tent in the middle that sort of as you approached it was like you could see it from one side and there was a radio broadcast coming from inside but then as you walked around it, you would slowly see that it was like ripped up on the other side and there was like a great, great pools of blood and, and a hand like holding the radio that had been playing what you'd been listening to the whole time. Um, and I think it really worked to create a mood. Um, 
and to kind of set people in the right mindset. <laughs> yeah, um, put people in the right mindset um, for what they were about to experience. Um, I think, yeah, we worked really hard on that room and it paid off a million times over um, as far as kind of translating what was going on when, because when you're in the queue, you also have some time to convey um, that like basic story. Um, if you're able to, the audio had some clues kind of as to what was going on. Um, and the other thing is that because it was inside, people could hear the screams of those that had gone in before them. And I think it built a beautiful anticipation for what was coming next. Um, Very cool, right? You know, I mean, that's always going to be the number one challenge, I think, in, in, in a lot of this stuff is uh, story and throughput. Uh, we mentioned uh, Transworld earlier, uh, and, and, and a couple of seasons ago, a buddy of mine and I, uh, we lectured on that, uh, how to maximize throughput without sacrificing story. And that, that I think that's an important element and really kind of uh, knowing what people are going to pay attention to. Because we can have all the story elements we want, but if they're not gonna pay attention to it, then hey, it's all done in vain, right? So it's about trying to always find that, that important blend. Uh, but that's cool that you guys are even considering that and thinking about that because it's really important. And really, quite frankly, one of the best ways to even address any of that stuff is to actually do it and 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 really kind of wait and see because I could sit and write all of the stuff you can do the same and we could try to project to try to to, to foresee what the guests are going to be into uh, and and you know based on our experience based on our knowledge and we truly try to put out truly it's basically an, an educated guess on, on to what we're going to do and 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 that, i think that's part of a lot of this and it's also part of the i think the benefit for haunting is you can make a lot of those adjustments uh there on site when you open uh which is a lot different than um like a permanent installation for a, a ride operation system right because if something's not working then well then you're going to be dealing with a lot of technical issues and stuff but for story elements and stuff a lot of times we find that hey you know what we can make some adjustments right then and there to try to help uh, convey it a little bit better very cool stuff what's our next slide all right we'll stick stick with stick it with you matthias can you talk about your experience with the actors there, okay, that's a, that's an important thing. Uh, what did you learn from them, and what are you planning to do for actor management and training uh, this upcoming year? Whatever you feel comfortable talking, you know about. But uh, you know that's something that I, 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 I dealing with now, as a matter of fact. But it's something that I deal with uh, constantly. So so I'm I'm excited to hear uh, your answer to this. Yeah, um, I think. Last year, I'm, I'm sorry, Jared, but actors were probably like, I feel like we made just about every misstep we could have possibly made regarding them. Um, we sort of recruited that just sub 100 group of people that you saw and uh, gave them pretty much no direction. Uh, we brought them in once prior to the night of the event um, and got them familiarized with the layout uh, and we, I think at that, at that time, told them what they were going to be, um, but there was no form of training, there was no review of the story, the night of, we thought we were going to have extra time to do some, some run-throughs before we actually opened, and as everything panned out, that time didn't really exist. Um, so we ended up, I, a couple of my friends were actors and I know they were like, you told me to stand here and do something scary and I have no idea what that means. Um, and so, yeah, there were definitely, I think, a lot of lessons, um, to take away from the way that that was handled. And, uh, for this upcoming year, we've got, uh, a lot of changes. If you could go to the next slide, so. Um, yeah, so these were just kind of some of our actors. Um, and as you can see, um, they, uh, a lot of them are in either heavy makeup or heavy prosthetics. 
Um, something we didn't really consider um, was that especially the heavy prosthetics and specifically that poor guy in the lower left there who I think is like one of our coolest designs in the whole thing but he was wearing a, a lot of stuff um, and that room was very very hot basically they start to sweat and their prosthetics would sweat off the thing is is that um, that owl right there was our like lead costume designer and makeup artist and, and one of the only people I knew how to reapply those prosthetics um, but she was in the maze so there became this fun little game we had to play with pulling people out at the right time to get them to, to reapply the makeup and stuff. And, and so there's some just like kind of like purely functional stuff like that, um, that we definitely, I don't think would have thought of unless we had experienced it, but now heading into next year, know how to, how to handle that stuff better. Um, from an actual acting standpoint i think the big changes we're making this this year is when we are recruiting people we're recruiting them for a role um so they're they're getting picked uh kind of based on what their interest already is um and they're going to get training from our scare actor lead on not only uh how the character is supposed to act relative to guests but also um, what the character's part in the story is. Um, and they're getting an explanation and, and they're probably, we have a script this year that'll be in the next question. Um, but um, they're going to get kind of training and an understanding of, of you know, what they mean in this world. Um, so they don't necessarily need to say the same thing over and over, um, but can still feel well-equipped to, to be that character. Um, the other thing about this upcoming year is we're relying a lot less heavily on um, video effects and a lot more heavily on practical effects. And um, especially now, thanks to the changes that we have to make because of COVID, um, uh, a lot of it is going to be character interaction driven. Um, and so we need to be able to expand, yeah, kind of beyond a written script and really give these people an idea of who their character is. Um, and so we'll be doing, yeah, multiple training sessions. Um, the other thing that was like a really simple thing that I feel like we overlooked was we didn't train people prior to the night of on um, the pathways they should take to get to their spot. So every time we did a shift change, it was like a 10 minute affair and it probably could have been a lot shorter. Um, and that, you know, damaged throughput, which was something that obviously as I went over was really important to us trying to move people through. Um, but, you know, even with all of those things all said and done, we ended up moving, I want to say a little over 1600 people through it in six hours. And it was a, a huge success, a lot of smiles and a lot of laughter and a lot of I don't know, it was an awesome night to be a person running the event, um, 1750, yeah. So yeah, it was, uh, it was great. And it was, I, I think hearkening back to like what really solidified me wanting to be in the industry was this event. It was seeing the people's response to, to all of the work that we had put together and just like so much happiness we were generating from, you know, scary stuff um really 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 great so yeah it makes a big difference right i think that's always the benefit of 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 being in the trenches as an actor you're you, you get that you know that that intimate moment when you lock eyes with the guest as as as, as a character uh, at that very moment, you are the face of the event, and so uh, actor training as you're learning is is absolutely uh, is crucial, and uh, you need to be able to uh, whoever the 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 the, uh, the performance trainer is or whatever whoever it's going to be, absolutely needs to be able to articulate the, those specific directions to the actors, and and that really does start with the writer. And then it passes down to to the to the creative director who's going to deal with that you know with the performance uh, folks. A, a lot of times, uh, it's the, all the same person, and so. Uh, but the, the the 
I'll share a little reality with you. There's never enough time uh, <laughs> training uh, these actors. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just one of those things. And so when you're dealing with a, a cast of a thousand people, um, over multiple nights, it gets pretty difficult uh, because you're paying for all these people and time is money. And so uh, that, that time is very limited. And so uh, really anytime uh, you can uh, lean into a, a veteran who's done it before, that can kind of go a long way because I agree with you. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I sympathize with you, you know, having folks not know what they're supposed to be doing. You know, a lot of people don't know, and that's okay, but it's up to, to the performance trainers and to the directors to be uh, are able to articulate that. And, um, you know, you try to certainly try to cast people in roles that they are somewhat interested in, but at the same time, you do have a job and you need to fill those roles with the best folks possible. So very cool stuff. Uh, what do we got next up? One more question for me. Okay, go for it. Matthias, you're in the process of working on a haunted house for the university for this upcoming season. Can you talk about your current role and the steps that you're taking now to realize this creative vision? Yeah. Um, and we can move forward one more slide while I talk about this. Um, yeah, so I am um, kind of uh, moving up from those subcommittee leads positions, I'm the creative director for this next year's um, project. And in our little particular pyramid, what that means is that um, my job is kind of twofold. I'm, I'm a part of the exec committee and I have three people working with me. Um, but I guess, you know, the end all be all on creative decisions is um, is me, which is fun. It's a ton of fun. It's a lot of pressure. Um, but yeah, so basically um um my role at the start was to come up with the the creative vision for the maze um i, I told you guys that i won a competition for my design um of a uh, reimagining of pinocchio as, as a horror escape room um i have a particular love for fairy tales in general. I think they're excellent fodder um, for horror experiences for like three main reasons. Um, those being that one, most of their source material is <laughs> available for use at this point. Um, two, like old fairy tales have a lot of adult concepts baked into them, but there are these worlds that are made for children. So those adult concepts often take like a very um, genuine kind of scary, uh, a very genuinely scary kind of form. Um, for example, in Pinocchio, Jiminy Cricket is like not the little dude in the suit that you know from Disney, but a big old cricket who climbs up onto the wall and scolds Pinocchio and then Pinocchio kills him. Um, and then the third thing that I think is really cool about fairy tales is that um, it just inherently, because there's something that you experience as a child, gets the guest in that mindset. And uh, it's like I talked about before, you know, our, our fears are formed when we're children. Our fears are the most potent when we're children. And to have someone's brain primed for that when they're walking through an experience like this, I think gives uh, me as the creative director a lot of room to play around with. Um, some less inherently scary things or less surprise-based scary things and some more conceptually scary stuff that I think is more lasting. Um, but yeah, so our theme this year is based around Alice in Wonderland, if you couldn't tell. Um, and basically, I sort of sow the seeds of what it's growing up into. It started as a couple of different um, ideas for scenes, just little blips kind of unconnected in my head and then um, the process really turned into uh, connecting those via you know writing a script and a story and now um, I'm going through and retranslating that script into second person um, which is a, I think a useful practice and, and a good thing to note for um, 
writers, I guess, <laughs> um, is kind of writing that second person script, which is to say like, uh, you walk into the room and you see this and you see this. Um, and it, it helps people kind of visualize not necessarily what uh, the story is, but more like what the experience is supposed to look like. Um, I think it's a good tool to have, but yeah. Um, so it goes from writing the script to then doing a handoff to the other people in the leadership structure who are heading up certain subcommittees. So like last year I was that layout person and that audio and video person. Um, and they sort of take the script, interpret the script, um, and then they start working in their subcommittees. And all of a sudden, my job sort of pivots from being the original creative ideas to being the person that helps make sure everybody is not only uh, stepping in the same direction, but also stepping in the same direction at a similar pace. Um, and sort of just making sure that all of these new ideas that are coming up from the source material are all uh, in alignment with one sort of cohesive vision and that we can deliver everything on time um, in a nice way. Um, I will say that Corona has thrown some serious wrenches in that process. It's gone from, I mean, we can't have uh, 1700 people moving through our maze anymore. Um, so, we're kind of adapting it to be, uh, as I mentioned before, a more character driven experience uh, in the vein of Trapped, um, which is something that Not Scary Farm put on. I don't know if everyone's familiar with it, but it's super cool. Look it up. There's a fun bootleg video of it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of, I don't know. I think it's maybe a blessing in disguise because uh, there's some cool stuff that we get to do um, in the sense that there's more guest interaction um, now that the event itself is less concerned with throughput um, and the more interaction you have, the more invested people get in your story and you can do some cool new things and play on some new kind of fears aside from just shock and surprise. Um, but it does, I don't know, it's hard. We have to basically redesign the whole thing um, from the ground up, so. Good practice though. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's it's tricky and it, it's difficult. We're having to do a lot of the pivoting as well. Uh, a couple quick notes is, is so you're very fascinated, especially with Pinocchio and uh, Al Alice in Wonderland in what we call good gone bad. And so uh, that was something that, you know, has been around for, for quite a while and, and it is, is great content to use. And you're right, you could uh, take it in all types of different uh, directions. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's kind of what a uh, creative director does, right? overall sometimes that creative director doesn't write the story sometimes they don't even come up with the actual uh, content but it is their job to make sure that uh, as much as the story is conveyed and uh, you're going to be there all the way to opening night and on to, to make sure that that all is being uh, seen through th to the best of your ability so uh, very cool stuff all right Let's go on to the next slide. And now we're gonna go next to Seth. Seth, we haven't heard from you in a long time. So let's hear from you about describing your first venture working with a haunted attraction company and maybe uh, what tips or lessons did you learn uh, that uh, you're able to carry with you now going forward? Yeah, um, definitely. I, I, I touched on earlier, uh, a couple years back at IAPA, I ran across a company called Little Spider Creations. Um, they were kind of my first way of dipping my toes in like professionally into the industry. Because uh, like I had said, I had tons of like home haunt experience, whether it's uh, doing things at home, building little props here and, th here and there at home, or uh, working with the university and the theme park engineering group at uh, college uh, doing our yearly haunt. Um, but with Little Spider Creations, I basically, uh, they're kind of like this, uh, you could call them like a jack of all trades when it comes to uh, themed entertainment. Um, really going out there and working for them, which we'll, we'll touch on this in a little bit on like what all we worked on out there. Um, but it really gave me like an insight on how things are actually built within the uh, haunted house industry. Because... You, 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 can take, you can take this design that like works great in theory 
and then uh, throw it out on the shop floor to get it built. And it just, it just doesn't work. Um, the way it basically was set up there is my desk and my computer was feet from the shop floor. I could look, I could look up from my computer and the table saw was right there. I could look to the left and for a while there, I could see the whole area where everything was getting welded. Um, until we started erecting 300 houses in the warehouse, uh, full of stuff. Um, but basically, man, just being there really taught me a lot about hands-on construction. Uh, and that's something being an engineer, that's something that I really value a lot. Um, it's not something you typically get to see a lot in internships. Uh, a lot of times you might be behind the computer as an engineer. Um, but I really think being out there and honestly making the mistakes yourself, like I could make a solid works model of let's say a pneumatic animatronic, something super simple, um, send it out to the floor as that person 50, a hundred feet from me is welding it. They were able to come over and ask me like, Hey, are you sure about this? Um, I was sometimes able to explain like why something was designed that way, or they caught my mistake and we were able to fix it right there. Um, honestly, the whole, the whole environment there really w was great for learning in, in my opinion. Um, a lot got built and a lot got, um, learned on my part. I think it's important to, to note uh, that, or at least reiterate what you were mentioning. They are kind of a jack of all trades. I mean, I think really in, in a lot of ways, they're like uh, kind of a fabrication company, but they've done so much work in the haunted attraction uh, industry and the theme park industry. So, so I think with any kind of situation, if you could kind of be out there in that type of field and see how these things are being built uh, is, is really crucial. And uh, I mean, Little Spider, they have a warehouse, uh, 13th floor here, uh, their branch here in, in Southern California has a warehouse. Uh, the, that's that's a huge opportunity to be able to see how these things are being produced. Anytime you go into like Universal or at Knotts, they have huge huge warehouses of 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 all the carpentry and all of that good stuff. So I think that's always just imperative and and, and, and priceless experience. So what are we looking at here? Yeah. Um. So up here, these four pictures to the left. Uh. This was kind of the I guess you could say development cycle of one of the facades for the haunted, one of the haunted houses I worked on. This one was called The Art of Torture. And the story behind this is that you kind of walk into this abandoned warehouse, right? You can see that in the top right picture. Um, you walk into this abandoned warehouse where this deranged artist was taking, basically killing people and bringing them back to this warehouse um, and making these, whether it's sculptures or some, some sort of just messed up, demented art out of these people he's killed basically um and the story of the haunt was that you would walk in you'd slowly start putting together like what's really going on because you'd come in through the lobby and you'd see looks like a normal lobby and then you get to the warehouse and you see all the shipments of things and you're like what what's going on here and then you start getting into like the galleries and everything and that's that's where you started realizing things were not right <laughs> um so my job there was basically um I would get thrown concept art. Uh, so I would be thrown this top right picture and they said, uh, they kind of just threw the uh, little guy down there for a, a rough sense of scale. Uh, I knew what kind of space we had at Six Flags. I was in close contact with everyone there, constantly getting them to pull measurements for me. Um, and basically take this art that everyone there, uh, the, all these incredible artists uh, would come to me with this, these ideas and they said kind of, manifested into reality um so there was this constant i don't want to say fight but it was this constant just engineer versus artist which are both artists in their own respect um but this these people who are who are dreaming very big and you'd have to take it and bring it down into like what can actually be built physically um i don't have a picture actually in here of what it turned out to look like um basically in the end like you can kind of see those those barrels and everything on the top of it and those ended up getting cut for the sake of well, we've got a flat facade and quite frankly, we're a little short on time. <laughs> um, so we cut those, but everything from taking this uh, concept art on the top right, going in and putting a 3D model and getting actual dimensions on it to going down and throwing like actual like framing on it all the way over to the bottom right where we were 
had built all that framing and then actually tore down a barn uh, about 15 minutes north of where Little Spider was in South Carolina. They tore down a whole barn to get all that really nice, like, worn old wood from the barn and completely covered the thing and then uh, sent it out for shipment all the way to Texas. <laughs> Um, and over there on the right, there was, uh, that was, that was actually an interesting story. That was a cryo chamber for one of the haunted houses we worked on called Alien Incubation. Um, the reason I'm hugging it there is because it was a long time coming. Uh, that was probably the third or fourth week after I had actually made the SolidWorks model of it and like sent it out and we were working on it. Um, because the guy I was working with closely, he, I was like, hey, how, what, what material do you have to like get this bent like in this basically half circle shape he's like don't worry i've got something turns out we got it and it didn't it didn't quite bend the way we wanted it to so it was a it was a lot of trips to home depot a lot of testing to figure out what could actually bend in that like tight half circle shape um and by the time it actually got built that was the first of them uh i think we ended up building eight of them uh they all ended up using this uh i believe it was like plastic coated masonite uh, that could bend really easily uh, and also ended up being able to be painted very easily too. Um, but yeah, it was this constant very cool. battle of figuring out what worked in real life. <laughs> right. Now, uh, what did you, what program did you use to create your elevations? My elevations? What do you mean by that? Well, the, the, those, those diagrams to your left. Oh, um, so all that was done in SolidWorks, which in all honesty is not the best software to be, um, using for this. Uh, it is, uh, basically I just made a model, uh, just a really, really rough model just to get elevations and that's it on how, how high everything should be. Um, and I was constantly working with Six Flags to see how high the trees were around there. Cause quite frankly, they were really trying to tuck this facade into a corner, um, so there was a few modifications here and there, but all of that was just done in uh, SolidWorks. And if, Very if cool. there are any engineers here, if you don't know how to use the weldment tool in SolidWorks, it, is, it was my best friend this whole summer, and I don't know um, what I would have done without it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I'm glad it all seemed to really work out beautifully. Very cool. What do we got, we, what do we have up next? Can you describe, well, you talked a little bit about who Little Spider is already. They're kind of a jack of all trades, fabrication company, haunted attraction uh, company. And, uh, you know, talk a little bit about in creating and installing for Six Flags because these attractions were designed to be broken down and transported, correct? So um, right, uh, we, can t we can touch a little bit on the whole jack of all trades thing. Along the top, you can see the progression of one of the haunted houses we worked on. But on top of haunted houses, they're not just doing like small little props or anything. Uh, on the left, they actually are, have just been opening these incredibly themed like Airbnbs. Uh, so the bottom right was inspired by Star Wars. And then um, they had just recently opened, it's getting a lot of articles written about it, actually. I've been seeing it pop up a lot on LinkedIn. They did a whole Harry Potter one. Um, and then there in the middle, they made these massive foam sculptures for Knott's Berry Farm. Um, and the way they do these massive foam sculptures is that they've got to withstand weather. Uh, so there's all these artists there that are incredibly talented foam sculptors and just sculptors in general. And all of that's getting coated with this what they call hard coat and for lack of better words it, it's almost like a truck bed liner almost that's basically taking these incredibly detailed structures and coating it with something that's going to be weather resistant or quite frankly like ab abuse resistant because if you've ever made something for a theme park it's going to get used and abused it's going to get hit um especially when it comes to haunted attractions and then over there in the bottom right that was the um first little project we worked on uh, the summer I was there. Um, if anyone's familiar with the Splash Water Parade at Six Flags Over Texas. Uh, so they basically made everything for that. Um, everything but the trucks that were pulling it. Uh, so they took these uh, small little trailers and created all the theming around it, created the water pumping system and everything. Uh, these massive sculptures. 
So it's not just it's not just all Halloween all the time at Little Spider, but they definitely are very good at Halloween stuff. <laughs> um, up there on the top, there was a, this was actually one of my favorite the favorite haunted house that I got to work on. So we did three: we did Art of Torture, uh, Alien Incubation, and The Curse of Ra. Funnily enough, The Curse of Ra was my least favorite to work on. Um, no particular reason. I just wasn't super sold on the Egyptian theme. Uh, but by the time we got it all done and all the elements came together, I thought that one was absolutely the most cohesively themed and just the coolest in general. Uh, so on the left, you can see like the concept, that was the concept art they threw me. This is what Six Flags is like, yeah, this is what we really like. And they were very, very adamant. like, we've got to have these massive statues on the side. And I, when, when, when I see these massive statues, I'm already a little scared. Um, <laughs> large statues texas winds i'm freaking out just a little bit but there's um if you look over to the right you can see they've actually kind of manifested themselves and i'm not sure if you can see you might be able to see on the bottom of his like calf there was this whole steel structure on the inside of it and honestly it was done out of order um but this the sculpture was done first and they came to me and they're like hey we um we want to make this really really sturdy so it was my job to take that, um, design a steel structure that could slip inside of it, basically cut holes on the back of it, slip the steel structure inside of it, um, and basically assemble it like a, like a big Lego set. You can see one of his arms is missing right there because that all slid in, like sheathed in and locked into place. And then he split at the waist as well. So we had two of those. And then the whole uh, framing of everything was also done very similar to what you saw in the previous picture with the Art of Torture. Um, this one was a bit more difficult considering it had a, some weirder angles to it. Um, and I'm not sure if it shows up in the picture over there, but these, there's these big Egyptian columns. Um, and working in a place like Little Spider, honestly, working in the haunt industry in general teaches you how to be really crafty with stuff that you don't really um, expect to be using. Uh, for these massive concrete columns, concrete, uh, we just used sonotube right this basically it's, it's like a, it's like a cardboard almost that they use to pour like construction footers um and then that was thrown uh on that with the hard coat and it is it is good to go it's not coming apart anytime soon um but i absolutely love the way the, that facade came out and everything yeah it looks it looks it's beautiful and uh for any folks who are able to check out any of the six flags parks or their events um or at least in the past few years i mean even here in southern california uh six flags magic mountain I, they did like it's called like red's revenge it's like a mm -hmm. little red riding hood type of thing and it, to me before i even knew that little spider did it to me it was like absolutely the best haunted attraction at fright fest at six flags magic mountain just the the, the level of detail uh, is you know you guys can kind of see it there on that top row and i'm just uh waiting to sign up for little spider when they finally do an airbnb horror <laughs> themed uh version uh very cool stuff okay what do we got next all right so um well, you did have some some experience, you know, before you even got into this stuff of just sort of volunteering and working your way up and then doing, the, the, you know, a campus haunt. And then you also have, you know, done all this work with, with uh, attractions that wound up at Six Flags. Can you talk a little bit about that, the, those differences? Because there's some very big, notable differences. Absolutely. Um, so... Just right off the bat, I'll kind of explain these two pictures. The, 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 the one on the top left there, that's just a panoramic I took probably midway through the summer um, of the shop uh, because I was on the second story of the shop one day and I looked out and I was like, wow, this is, this is kind of crazy. Uh, we had three full haunted houses set up in there um, pretty much all of summer that were all being worked on simultaneously. And there was also a tank being worked on in the bottom right right there as well. Um, so a lot going on there a lot of the time. Um, but honestly, just one of the biggest differences was the fact that this stuff wasn't, uh, just for Halloween night anymore, or just for like one night of the night of the year. Uh, so obviously with that comes a lot more budget. Um, it's not being funded out of the pockets of me and the org or, um, 
you know, whoever's just working on it, it's, it, you've got a lot of money to make this stuff work well. Um, and I could really see that. Like I, we made a drop panel, right? And I presented them with my drop panel design. And as soon as I, as soon as I went to them and the Mark, which was the oldest guy, he's been in the haunt industry for, he's been professionally in it for 30 plus years. Um, I don't even know how long he's been in it before that. But as soon as I showed it to him, he goes, nope, not going to work. Um, so we made probably one of the beefiest drop panels I've ever seen. Um, Cause he's like, if we're selling this to Six Flags to work for X amount of years, he's like, we don't want to have to do any sort of upkeep on it. We don't want our customers calling us saying, Hey, your thing you sold us to work for X amount of years broke, come fix it. Or how do we fix it? Um, so we really, I really had to design a lot of that with that in mind is that um, this stuff is designed to work thousands and thousands and thousands of times in one month, be torn down and then put right back up for, I think we're, we're looking at a life expectancy of about five years for these, if I want, if I'm correct. Um, and mind you, all these, they're not, they're not just like um, small little collapsible. Like this is every single panel from that had to be taken apart. Um, and all of these, each one of these haunted houses, so three haunted houses, we had two shipping containers for each of them. The day where we took all of these down and moved them out to the shipping containers in the parking lot was not fun. <laughs> Uh, but all of this and everything for it had to be designed to fit in these shipping containers um, and then be shipped from South Carolina all the way to Texas. And then everything in there had to make sure we didn't melt. Uh, so any sort of like latex or any sort of costumes that we did could not, if it couldn't withstand the heat, we didn't want to ship it, you know. Um, and in the bottom right there, that was the tent that we put two of the haunted houses in. We put uh, Alien Incubation and the Curse of Ra in that tent right there. Um, and that was difficult. And, and there's a lot of things that you don't really know about the tent when let's say like the customer comes to you with it. Like for instance, there were guide wires keeping that tent in tension. Um, they said we had 20 feet, but in reality we had 18, uh, because of the guide wires. So that was stuff that, uh, honestly we found out about halfway through the summer and we had to make a lot of changes on the fly, uh, there in the shop, get as creative as possible to, get the max amount of change, I guess you could say, max amount of change for the least amount of effort because we are on such a tight schedule. We produced all three of these haunted houses in, we started in May and they shipped early August. Uh, so the turnaround on these was pretty tight. Uh, and we had a crew of maybe, including myself, people working on this, we probably had about 15 people, 15, 16, anywhere from 15 to 20 people working on these things all summer. Um, so the turnaround was really tight. Um, and typically, I mean, with, um, if you're doing like a home pond, it's something you can kind of chip away at the block, chip away on the block, like here and there. Uh, this was a, this wasn't, this, it wasn't a nine to five. It was an eight to six, eight to seven hour day, uh, every day. Uh, because in all honesty, just getting these done to a quality that we were happy with was top priority. Um, and honestly, there was, uh, since it wasn't a tent at Six Flags, you had to follow all sorts of different fire codes though and, and, and ADA standards that were not um, typically present in normal buildings. Uh, for instance, like these are taken down, they might have left them up for, if they leave them up for 11 months out of the year, but they are taken down for one month of the 12 months, it is considered a temporary structure if I'm correct. Um, Ted, if I'm wrong, please feel free to chime in. <laughs> No, yeah, it's all of these are, are temporary structures. I mean, uh, unless obviously they're inside a solid warehouse of some sort. Um, I know uh, like in Universal Studios in Hollywood, absolutely all temporary structures, uh, but in, at Not Scary Farm, they do have some warehouses where the mazes are just left up and they are, you know, I mean, they're, they're there all year long, but you're right. I think uh, when you're dealing with the fire codes and you're dealing with all of these types of permits for all of these things, uh, that is one of the big differences, I think, from going to from a home haunt up to an independent haunt up to the theme parks. Now, for mo for all the theme parks, you're going to have people that are on the team that are the technical directors and all of that. They're going to be able to help uh, people that are learning uh, navigate 
some of that stuff, but uh, th they're going to do things like what Mark did to you and say, mm -hmm. this drop down panel is no way going to last an entire season, let alone five years or whatever it's going to be. And so, yeah, so all of this stuff is absolutely uh, built like overbuilt because you not only do you not want it to break down, you don't want it to accidentally hurt somebody or anything like that or some sort of weird malfunction. Mm -hmm. Kind of um, going off that whole overbuilt discussion right there, there was a, mm -hmm. there's a scare at the end of Art of Torture. Uh, they wanted a big scare at the end of every haunt uh, with, alien incubator it was a not 20 18 foot tall alien queen um that was sculpted probably close to 30 something feet um and my job was to figure out how to get people to walk under the legs of this alien queen and exit the haunt um so basically there was this structural i-beam that was made where the alien queen could like lean over it and uh the head was like puppeted so that we had a strobe light on it it was in all honesty, a very stationary prop, but you put the strobe light on it and it, you couldn't tell. Yeah, you walk into the room and it was, it was terrifying. But, um, oh, I had, had one, lost my train of thought there. Oh, Art of Torture. There was, um, talking about Overbuilt, uh, I had this idea where the, the wall was going to go forward and come back uh, all through the use of like pulley systems. And Mark, again, he said, no, 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 we're not doing pulleys. We're not doing any pulleys. It's got to all be self-contained. Nothing could be attached anywhere else. Um, so we ended up using these gas cylinders, which if you don't know what those are, that's basically what's on, when you open your trunk, that's what pushes it up. So the actor would pull this lever and it'd throw the wall toward the, towards the guests. Um, and the gas cylinders would pull it back up into place. Um, so at first we had gas cylinders on there that were, way 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 too stiff because i was anticipating a lot of art and spinning blades to be added to it those got cut so we had to change the way the uh cylinders were on there but i am not anticipating that uh that wall to be breaking anytime soon <laughs> right you know and and that's the kind of way that you know those are good examples on on how you have to to really pivot but if you kind of think about what we've really talked about today a lot of this stuff is 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 really uh more the technical aspect mixed with what matthias was talking about earlier which is is more of the sort of the early on creative aspect what's our next slide here okay all right i'll i'll, I'll wake up matthias are you there Matthias, are you still with us? I am, yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, oh. So what are the three most important components for creating and producing a haunted attraction? Okay, my answer changed after listening to Seth talk at the end there. Um, I think number one definitively is an ability to creatively think on your feet i think it's something that we heard from you ted and from steph and from me is that stuff happens and if you're able to do that you can adapt and you can change things on the fly that are going to ultimately service the experience for the guests um and you have to do it sometimes in the case of what seth was talking about you know um so yeah that's my number one um, my number two is also actually in line with what Seth was saying, and it was already on my list. Um, open, direct, and frequent conversation with uh, whoever is in charge of the place you are hosting your haunt. Um, and that could, you know, take several different forms. It could be someone who owns the building, in the case of the university stuff that we've been doing, or the people who are figuring out the permits and everything for setting something up as a temporary structure. Um, but just constantly having a dialogue with those people and making sure that you're not putting a lot of effort into designing and building something that can't happen um, from a safety standpoint. And then my number three, and this is kind of me speaking from my experience with the past two years doing the university stuff, uh, is a fully fleshed out direction with a clear master plan that tells people the steps you're going to take to achieve that direction. Um, and that has helped time and time again in the stuff that I've been doing 
um, where it's just like, you point to it and you're like, yeah, okay, this is what we're going to do. You know, this is what we want. These are the steps to reasonably get to where we want. And if we have extra time, these are the, the extra things we can do to make it even better. Um, and it just helps keep everybody on the same page and, and moving in the same direction, as I said earlier, and stepping at the same pace as well. All right. Very, very good. <laughs> Seth, what do you think? Yeah, so honestly my number one is we, we, me and Mathi Matthias really agree on like our number one is that there you have to be able to change things on the fly um people are going through people are getting scared people act differently than normal people do when they're scared uh people will run into things people will break things people will hit things <laughs> people like things will get broken and that is something you have to go into producing a haunted attraction absolutely understanding and knowing that it's going to happen to be prepared for it happening either with a plan to fix it or design something that is never going to break. <laughs> um, second for me is honestly everyone working on it or whoever's in charge has to be passionate about it. Um, everyone at Little Spider and everyone that I worked with at UT, everyone on the teams were so incredibly passionate about getting this common goal done, either coming into work every day or coming to project meetings. People, the, the, the passion really shows through in the finished product. Because um, you don't, you don't want to phone in something like this. There's, there's, there's so much just create creativity that can be a product of the passion like that, if that makes sense. Um, finally, this one's a basic one. But um, sound, sound and music. I think sound and music is probably, it's something that I feel like a lot of people look over. Um, but sound and music for me is, is huge in designing any haunted attraction. Uh, at Little Spider, we had these very, very specific themed catered soundtracks where that, that kind of flowed through each room and through the haunt. Like you would, you'd have like this, this 1950s music in the, in the lobby of the, uh, the um, Art of Torture. And then it'd get to these industrial like bangings and all sorts of like nasty industrial noises once you got through the rest of it. And by the time you were in the end of it, it was this very like beautiful like opera noise, which was in all honesty, like a juxtaposition to the terrible things you were looking at, quite frankly. Um, with the Teapeg Haunted House, uh, it's quite the opposite. We didn't have a cohesive theme. We didn't have like really a story. Uh, we had a shorter experience where um, we wanted it to be high energy. It was short. So we wanted people to get in get scared and get out. So we were just blasting this like techno music soundtrack. It was high energy. It kept people on their feet. Um, and for me with the TPEG thing, the biggest thing for me was just keeping it as high energy as possible in that room. And I think sound and music definitely is the, the icing on top of the cake uh, for any haunted attraction. Very good. Uh, I mean, and these are all Good components. I got to tell you, though, for me, number one, hands down, most important component ever for any of these things, safety, safety, safety. If I'm not creating safe experiences, I am not getting work in this industry. Uh, it's always crucial right to be well versed in what is going on in your own region your own state your own county city health and safety requirements i mean we're not going to open if, if we're not safe here uh and uh I, i'm not going to waste my time and create a, a creativity or my crew or the the techs or anything like that if we can if i can't fully comprehend on how to do it safely. So, and, and how can I train people if, if, if I don't know how to do it safe, safely? So to me, it's always about safety, number one. That revolves and is always there currently hovering over my uh, aching head anytime I'm doing any of, of the, the creative writing. Uh, second for me, and it does kind of drift around what you guys are saying. I mean, passion can go a long way, but for me, it's about the team. It's about surrounding yourself with the, is the, the most talented people that you can find uh, because none of this stuff that I've ever worked on was created by just me. I can't, I, I, I'm not, 
I can't do all of that stuff. I'm not a builder or anything like that. Uh, so I need to surround myself with the best people possible to help see these visions through. But a good team can exceed all of my wildest dreams and, 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 and visions. And, and so none of that cool sound or the, the music or, or, or the lighting or, or the actors or anything like that is, is, is happening, um, at least to the degree that I'm, I'm hoping it can reach without the, the right folks. And then number three for me is a little bit more light, but, it, but I think it's true. It, it, it is about having fun. Um, I realized that this is a business and uh, we are in the entertainment business. Uh, it's my job to create experiences that allow folks to have a good time and have fun and be entertained and hopefully, hopefully a little bit scared throughout all of this thing. But we want them to return. That's part of the business. And so uh, they will return if they had a good time and that they had fun. And I do feel that that is uh, infectious. I think we have witnessed it. I certainly have witnessed it. it I mean, sometimes, like you're saying, when you, the audience can tell when something is being phoned in. I really believe that. And so, uh, it doesn't matter what the attraction is if if people are are um, safe and are having a good time and it's a good team. I think it's going to at least have the best odds possible to be an, an experience that the guests uh, appreciated and and hopefully will want to come back on. I think that was the last question that I had for you guys. Is there any other more slides or is that it? That's all the slides, but I was going to chime in on the safety thing a little bit. Like I absolutely agree. Yeah. There was um, the kind of thing we talked about at Little Spider a lot. Like we are in the business of making people feel unsafe, basically. Um, yep. And it's really hard to do that safely. Uh, but when you do achieve mm -hmm. it, it's phenomenal. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I had designed something, any, any sort of like pivot arm or anything. And I, I took it to any, any, anyone that was above me. And they said, all right, how high off the ground is that? And I'd tell them how high off the ground is it? Like, nope, people are going to, someone's going to stick their fingers in that. I'd be thinking to myself, <laughs> yep. I'm like, no, they're not. But I'm like, you got, you, you have to take those things into account when you're designing things because you, you, you it, it, it's, it's just so imperative to have those, those things accounted for especially when you're designing an attraction that thousands and thousands of people are going through possibly in one night. I, I totally agree. And, and so uh, with that said, uh, that's really kind of all that we, we have here uh, planned to at least share with everybody. Uh, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, um, but uh, if, if anybody has any questions or anything like that, uh, I don't know if anybody is still with us, hanging out with us. Hopefully, uh, people are still awake and, 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 and cognizant. Maybe there not. Any questions out there, you can throw them in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask if you want. Um, I, I guess I have a question, but... Um... Ted, you and I have talked about this before. I was wondering if you could just uh, go into a little bit more about the attractions that, such as Trapped and Alone and like those types of fonts as well. Sure, so what uh, Zochi's referring to is, and, and Matthias actually mentioned it earlier, uh, uh, Trapped was a response to uh, the first upcharge uh, time ticketed uh, haunt uh, at a major theme park uh, that debuted in uh, Bush Gardens in Tampa named Alone. And so these are sort of almost, I don't want to say that they're, they're anti-haunts, but they are certainly the anti-almost theme park haunt. Um, you are going in with a very small group of people and alone you went by yourself and it is they are theatrically driven experiences trapped was a little bit more uh, almost uh, kind of what you would expect uh, a lighter version of an escape room to be 
uh, but the, the guests are pulsed through the experience, uh, through that, that time ticketed uh, uh, offering that they have. And this was an opportunity to, to create more of an, an intimate type of, of uh, entertainment. I'm not, I'm not sure it was like super scary or anything like that. It was probably a lot more thrilling to, to folks who are outside of, of these types of things. But, uh, you know, a lot of it is what we would call immersive theater. And, and that's, that's very big uh, out here in, in, in Southern California where um, you, everything is a lot more intimate. And so it's really the opposite of what you would see at, at Six Flags or at uh, any of the Cedar Fair parks or uh, Universal where you have the huge conga lines of, you know, zillion people going through the attraction and you're just kind of shuffling from, from one room to the next and you see the, the scare actor pop out and do their thing at the, you know, the groups ahead of you and then it's your turn and all that stuff. With, with Alone and with Trapped and these more intimate types of experiences uh, are, you know, they're not for everybody because they are a little bit more, um, like I said, I don't think they're necessarily more scary, but they certainly are more intense. Is that kind of what you're thinking, Sochi? Um, yes, thank you. Cool. Thank you, Ted, for that response. Our next question slash pair of questions come from Kylie and Ian in the chat. Matthias, this is targeted towards you. What is the budget that you work with at UCSD? And how did you all recruit actors or uh, when did you send out the word and where did you look for to find them? Um, okay, our budget for this upcoming year was like slightly bigger than the budget we had for Petrified because we got um, a grant to work on a very specific component of our, our maze that I'm really excited about called the audience. Um, and the basic idea is like, uh, we're gonna put guests on stage and there'll be a robotic audience that uh, follows them as they walk across, basically, um, using some fun Arduino trickery and a lot of 3D printing. Um, but we got a special grant for that, which was about $3,000, um, in addition to what we were already uh, handed by the school. We were floating at like just under $20,000. Um, that is super subject to change because the people that ordinarily give us money are having their budgets cut because of Corona. So we're going to find out what we actually get to work with in about a month. Um, as far as recruiting actors, um, I mean, UCSD, you wouldn't think is known um, for acting, but there, there's like a big, because the La Jolla Playhouse is like kind of a big deal. Um, there's a relatively large community uh, there. Um, a lot of it was our friends. A lot of it was um, some of our art classes have a requirement for you to, to like work on a large scale production. And this fulfilled that requirement. Um, or we talked to the teachers that had that requirement and recruited through them. Um, and it was just like a Google form sign up. I mean, a lot of, a lot of those people were also just our friends. Um, yeah, so for this upcoming year, we're gonna have, uh, more of a process, but again, that stuff is compounded by what we can actually do, uh, given you know who's going to be on campus and, and all of that. So we're still kind of in flux on that. All right, thank you for that response. Um, the next question comes from Jamie from UCF. This can go to any of you, but she's asking for the best advice for a club with little experience in executing a large project um, and with a low budget offering from their school. So kind of little experience, low on money. What advice do you have for them? Uh, I can. Can I ch let me ahead. chime in real quick, Seth, and then and then because I have no business talking about like like uh, campus haunts or anything like that. But I can tell you one thing uh, that that I, I feel strongly about. I feel I still feel like no matter what, you can have a black full-on blacked out hallway like full attraction with no lights no nothing but if you have the right actors you could make it terrifying that's my two cents so so in other words you don't have to have a huge budget if you have the right actors that's my two cents 
Yeah, piggybacking off of that, like UT, I, I think if I'm correct, we, uh, I think we maxed out at about $2,000 uh, for our most recent haunted house. And our most effective scare was probably a blackout room that we had people, we gave people battery powered masks that they could turn on and scare people. And they just hid in the shadows. No one could see them. No one could see anything in that room. And that was probably the most effective scare in the whole thing. Uh, but as far as best advice for someone uh, starting, start early. Um, that's what kind of bit us in the butt our first year. Uh, really talk to people at your school, figure out where you can host an event like this, whether it's on campus or off campus. Um, people, are, people, people at schools, from my experience, or at least at UT, are fairly open to the idea of it. Uh, if you spin it the right way, say like, oh, it's a fun event. It's a safe event here on and at, at Halloween for students to go to. Um, and you can start and, and kind of start there, start at the venue. And then from there, the venue would kind of refer me out and refer people on my team out to go places to find money. Um, whether that be places on campus, places outside of campus. Um, it's a unique project. It's cool. It's, it's eye catching. And I think people with money or organizations with money are kind of almost eager to put their name on something that if you, if you, if you spin it to be as cool as that, I know like all these students in theme entertainment are, have the potential to make an attraction like this. Um, so really talk yourself up, get money from people that like that have the money um, to give for an event like this. Cause like I said, I feel like people are, kind of eager to sponsor something as cool as this. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I mentioned it today, but like our, the reason we have the budget we have is because it was a school event prior to us taking over. And since we've taken over, they, I, I don't know, they've kind of doubled down on the project. Everybody loves working on something like this. Um, and a ton of our budget actually goes to, to renting the building that we're allowed to, to put stuff in, um, like more than half of it. But it, like the, the guy that runs that building loves putting on this project and he puts in so much extra time because he loves doing this stuff. And, and you'll, you'll find that um, this as a concept for, for people in universities is like, it's something they do, they really gravitate towards and you can sell it really easily. Um, it, it just objectively is something really cool and it's not something that you see everywhere uh, yet. So I think, yeah, sell yourself well. The thing I'll say about horror is that, um, yeah, you don't, you don't need any money to make something scary. I mean, that's why there are so many horror movies that are the way they are. Um, they're cheap to make uh, and even like you know in the video game sphere Five Nights at Freddy's uh, it's so simple but uh, it's a good idea um, so yeah my advice would follow um, kind of both what Ted and Seth said like start early and really like think a lot about it there is a scary idea out there you just need to tap into it and the only way you're going to get there is through a lot of iterative thinking um, and a lot of back and forth. And then once you have that, do the best you can possibly do. I think, like Ted said, specifically with actors, because they are, they are you know, the blood cells that, that keep an attraction actually going. Um, and they're probably the cheapest thing you're gonna come across. So uh, really put a lot, of, a lot of effort into the places where you can see, you know, uh, that effort being worthwhile. Awesome responses. Thank you all. Any uh, last questions out there? Can I go? Yeah, Hi. yeah, go for it. Go for it. Sorry. Um, hey, guys. Um, so I was wondering, uh, I have a question for all three of you, actually. Um, what is a maze or like a haunted experience that you didn't necessarily work on, but you thought was like your favorite scare experience? And like, why do you think the reason for that was? I can I can chime in with something. Um, there is a haunted house in Plano, Texas, just right outside of Dallas, uh, called Dark Hour Haunted House. It's uh, kind of creatively run by this guy named Alan Hops. If you're in the haunt industry, you've probably heard of Alan Hops. This dude is a mad scientist uh, when it comes to these kind of things. 
And I have never seen such clean, like clean everything. It, it, it is the, the cleanest haunt facility I've ever seen. Um, it is the highest tech haunt facility I have ever seen. I don't know how much money they have put into it, but if you're ever in the Plano area um, at any time of the year, I really just recommend going and checking it out because it's, it's the highest tech, cleanest haunted house I have personally ever seen. I'll go. Um, so for me, uh, one of, that's such a hard question, uh, but off the top of my head, uh, we have uh, an, um, an a, a event, a, an attraction out here in Southern California named Delusion. And Delusion is, is a little bit kind of what I was talking about in terms of like the traps of the world and stuff like that, but it's on steroids. Heavy, heavy duty interactivity with the actors and, 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 and touch and having to crawl underneath beds to like hide from monsters that are searching. It's very free forming. It's not a linear type of standard attraction that we see uh, typically at theme parks and uh, the, the famous independent haunted attractions. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's a hot ticket to get. It sells out every year in, in minutes. It's like 75 or 80 bucks just to get in for one person. So it's very expensive, but it is incredible. It, I mean, I've never seen so many people just like be freaking out. Like these are like my designer friends and all that stuff. And, and, and we're just cowering in a corner because of the, the amount of storytelling. I mean, people talk about, oh, walking through a haunted house is like walking into your own horror movie. And I do believe that that's really true. But something like Delusion that is this different level of immersive theater and heavy interactivity is, is truly like being in a horror movie because you have to make decisions and you have to, to, to kind of go along with these horrific narratives that are extremely deep. And it has been a huge influence on me. And, and so that really helped out with a lot of things when we created a, uh, what was billed as the first R rated uh, horror escape room escape experience named murder co a, a few a couple of years back and so we were really influenced by things like delusion that uh implements interactivity and immersion to tell these uh deeper stories so uh, that that that's at least one that i could think of off the top of my head that i haven't had anything to do with but i enjoy going anytime that it's open Um, for me, I haven't actually been able to go to a lot of those kind of smaller haunt things. I've done a few escape rooms around San Diego that were vaguely scary. Um, and for the first time this past year, I got to go to Not Scary Farm and Horror Nights. Uh, and that was amazing. Uh, out of those two, my favorite maze. And it might, it might just be because it was the first like really full-blown scary maze I, I went in. Uh, pretty much ever was um, Waxworks at Not Scary Farm. I absolutely loved the aesthetic of Waxworks. Um, yeah, I just thought it was a really cool, cool experience. Awesome, thanks guys. I'll be looking those up later and scaring myself. Awesome, well let's all give the three of our presenters a zoom round of applause here. Thank you guys so much for sharing your experience with us. Um, so I learned a ton from you guys and I'm really excited to go back and watch the video of this afterwards. I'm going to share my uh, screen real quick just with a short PowerPoint with some updates. Oh, here it is. One sec, there it goes. Um, just to give you guys a sense of where we're at. So if you ever need to contact us, email TEA at ND if you're looking for any updates on the skill sessions themselves. So today we learned on haunted house design and right up Ted's alley, like he was saying, we're gonna learn on interactivity from Michael Libby, um, who's the founder and CEO of World Builder with a ton of other super cool experience. So come on out, same time, same Zoom link this Thursday, um, and we'll learn from them on interactivity and the software that he has particularly designed for crafting interactive experiences. Next slide. This Saturday, then, we have a networking night going on at 4 p.m. Eastern, so in the afternoon. 
It'll be the same Zoom link, but it's gonna be students and industry professionals all joining together. So this is an awesome opportunity to meet the other students that are on these calls with you or in group chats, but also to have a chance to interact with um, and learn from on a personal level, industry professionals, as well as a lot of those professionals are gonna be ones who have led sessions throughout. So if you were really interested and you wanna like meet one of those summer session industry professionals on a more personal level, level this is a great opportunity um, to do so. We'll do it over Zoom. Uh, we'll break out into a small breakout room so you get like a three or four person um, conversation started up. Um, so look forward to that on Saturday. This is a quick call for session submissions. So if there's anything you did, whether it was for the motion graphics skill session or for the parade you designed in the live entertainment one, if you can just drop those into this Google Drive link that I'm gonna post right now, we're collecting those and highlighting them on our website. So all the awesome work you guys do in these summer skill sessions, um, anybody who's interested and on our website will be able to see them. Um, so feel free to fill that up for us so we can highlight your guys' incredible work. With that, that's our question and answer slide, but I believe, I guess I'll ask, are there any last questions out there? Okay, awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us today and uh, I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you, everybody. Thank yeah. you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for putting this together. This is a lot of fun. Thanks, Ted. It was nice uh, hearing what you had to say. And thanks, Jacob, for putting it on. I really appreciate it. Us. You guys made it made my job easy here. I just sit here and <laughs> do all the talking. So you guys have a great night now. Yeah, you too. Bye.